Hi everybody, this is Lisa and it's time again for another Verbling class. In this class we're going to be doing some reading and if you have a reservation go ahead and uh, get it now and come into the class so that we can get started. Uh, hi Aisha, how are you doing? Are you there? Good. <laughs> hi there. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, some people have uh, reservations and you yep. can come and get them now and that way as soon as everybody comes into the Google Hangouts then we can start the class. We're going to be reading an, an article. It's actually a blog post and the blog post is from an author named Daniel Coyle and he has written a couple of books. Uh, one of his books is called The Talent Code and so he likes to write about uh, success and the things that we can do to uh, help ourselves uh, do better in the things that we are interested in doing better. So I always like to read his um, information because it doesn't matter if you are an artist or a musician or a business person or learning a foreign language. I like his, um, his ideas and his information and his research that he does. I always find it very interesting and useful uh, for us, people who are learning other languages, and so especially for you guys who are learning uh, how to improve your English. And so we're going to be reading his article. Uh, like I said, it's actually from his blog. And so um, if you click on the link, I will give it to you guys again. I'm just uh, going to talk a little bit is here as we get everybody into the Google Hangouts. The link is um, in the Verbling chat. It is a link to a Google document because I have copied from his blog uh, and pasted it into the Google document. I also provide the link directly to his website at the top so in case you're interested in other things that he writes about. He often um, writes blog posts and puts up videos or pictures or things like that so it's really good um, I like his writing it's a good example of uh, some good English also for people who are interested in a little bit higher level English it's um, it's not your everyday kind of uh, something you would find like in People magazine or something but uh, so it's a little bit uh, more academic if you're uh, studying for some tests like the TOEFL exam or something like that, um, he's a good person to read um, because it's fun to read his stuff but it also um, has good uh, high level vocabulary in it. Okay, so let's uh, get started. We have people, I'm just going to say hi to everybody. Hi Aisha and hi Amparo, how are you? Hi teacher, how are you? Good. Uh, and uh, Denise or Dennis? Yeah, Dennis. Hi. Hi, Dennis. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Great. Hello, everybody. Hi there. And where are you from, Dennis? I'm from Russia. Oh, okay. Great. And hi, Ricardo. How are you? Hello, teacher. Hello, everybody. How's Sao Paulo? Yes, yeah, Sao Paulo, Brazil. <laughs> All right. Great. And uh, Rodolfo, how are you doing? I'm fine. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. <laughs> Aisha, do you like People Magazine? <laughs> Not really, but I find it Yeah, um, I don't know if uh, Aisha caught it. I don't know if everybody else caught it, but my reference to um, People Magazine, People Magazine is a magazine in the United States that is mostly kind of like a gossip magazine where they write about movie stars and singers and actresses, things like that. Um, always they are talking about who married who, who got divorced from who, who had a baby, <laughs> all those types of things. Um, and it's funny because just the other day I was working with uh, one of my private students and he's a law professor from Brazil and so he likes to read very academic uh, texts and he said reading in English for him in the academic text is quite easy 
and but reading People magazine is harder because <laughs> <laughs> because it's so many different words that he does not is not so familiar with, and that's a certain type of writing. So <laughs> it's it's kind of funny. Okay, okay, Tan, you can't join. All right, well you can listen. All right, so let's see. Looks like everybody's there. So what I'm going to do is put the article that we have in the screen share. And what I like to do for the reading classes is I like to uh, read first. So while I'm reading, that is giving you the opportunity to listen to how I pronounce the word. So you can be reading along. And if there's particular words that maybe you haven't come across before or you're not sure how to pronounce them, listen to how I'm pronouncing them. And then everybody is going to have a chance to read. And this article is not very long, but it does have a lot of words that I'm probably going to um, explain. So we'll probably have time at the end to discuss it and uh, talk about the article itself and then also talk about maybe what it brings up for you if you have uh, some ideas about it or maybe you do some of these things in your own life. Mm. So let's get started and if, let me just tell everybody who's out in Verbling land, if you are watching uh, the class right now and you are a member you can come into the class uh, for one ticket and that way you will also have the opportunity to read and practice your reading and also your pronunciation and speaking uh, when we get to the discussion part also if you have any questions make sure you uh, get your questions answered that's what you're here for and I can help you so please if you if you don't understand a certain word or a how it's being used then uh, ask me and uh, it will be fine for you to interrupt me okay and if you're having any kind of uh, connection problems uh, just come back in as soon as you can if you uh, get dropped out and you have to come back in that's fine and we'll just keep uh, moving on okay so the title is five surprising habits of super creatives okay so you guys probably understand that they're surprising because maybe we you wouldn't think of these certain things that they were, are doing um, and we're talking about super creative so we're talking about people that are pretty famous uh, for something or other uh, maybe they're writers maybe they're scientists you know somebody like Albert Einstein is very uh, well known person, uh, Hemingway they mentioned here, so people who are very creative and what, so it's basically going to talk about what kinds of things do they do and I guess they're surprising. Alright, he says, and remember this is uh, this guy Daniel, the author, so he's writing this post, so he's uh, writing in the first person, so he says I, okay. So I am a hopeless sucker for stories about the daily habits of geniuses. You know, the ones that reveal Hemingway used only knife sharpened German made number two pencils or that Balzac sucked down 50 cups of coffee a day. I love these stories partly for the voyeuristic buzz and partly because they sometimes contain useful tips. Okay, Asia? I am a hopeless sucker for stories about the daily habits of geniuses. You know the ones that we read him in the way used only knife sharpened, German made number two pencils, or that Balzac sucked down six cups of coffee a day. I love this story, partly for the voyeuristic balls and partly because they sometimes contain useful tips. Mm -hmm. Good. So I'm going to explain a few things here, and if I don't explain something that you want to know, just let me know. So he says, I'm a hopeless sucker for. So that's a, a phrase that we use in English or an expression, to be, so here's the verb, to be a sucker. And a hopeless sucker means basically this whole thing, if you say you're a sucker for or a hopeless sucker for something, it means that you can't resist. You really enjoy that or you really like it. So you could say things like, I'm a sucker for uh, romantic comedies. That means you like romantic comedy movies. Or I'm a sucker for um, chocolate. That means anytime somebody's going to offer you chocolate, you're going to take it. So anytime you're a sucker for something, that means you, you have to 
to give in. You have to take it. You like it. You want to do it. So you can be a sucker for pretty much anything. You can be a sucker for certain types of food, a sucker for certain types of uh, movies, love songs, something like that. And he's so what he's a sucker for is the daily habits of geniuses. He likes to know what what do people do who we consider genius. That's what he studies. He wrote the book called The Talent Code. So he's always curious about what makes people uh, succeed and do these amazing things that not everybody does in life. Okay? So that reveal. So the word reveal means to like uncover or to show. And uh, the other one here maybe is voyeuristic. He says, I love these stories partly for the voyeuristic buzz. Voyeuristic means you're kind of... Uh, um, mm, traveling in their life. You're seeing it from their point of view, so you're kind of on the outside, but you're living like as if you were them. So when you learn about what people do every day, it's like you get a, you are part of their life. You get to see what they're doing, and the, it gives you a buzz, which means it makes you excited or makes you happy. So whenever you have a buzz, uh, it's something that makes you excited. And he also says that they can sometimes contain or have useful so sometimes we might actually learn for something so for example if you're a writer you're probably would be interested in the daily habits of successful writers if you're a scientist you might be interested in what kinds of things did uh, Einstein do and that kind of thing he says I just found the mother load daily rituals a new book by Mason Curry which details the habits of 161 notable scientists playwrights philosophers and writers. It's a useful read because it changes the way we think about creative types, specifically about how they organize their days. Okay, Amparo? I just found the Mother Load Daily Ritual, a new book by Mason Curry, which details the habits of 161 notable mm -hmm. scientists, playwrights, philosophers and writers. It's a useful read uh, because it changed the way we think about creative types, specifically about how they organize their days. Mm -hmm. Okay. You guys know what the mother load means when you say, I found the mother load. <laughs> That's a phrase that you might hear, especially like in movies or something, uh, when they're trying to be funny. Uh, the mother load just means something that's really great. Like, it, it, if you're interested, since he is so interested in finding out how successful people live their lives and what they do, he just found a book that basically tells you that about so many of these different uh, important people. And so that would be called the mother load because it's like an amazing find for him. It's like he struck it rich. He found gold. He found the thing that is going to uh, give him all the information that he wants. So for example, if you're a chocolate lover and you just love chocolate and you go to a store and you see that they have like a huge display of chocolate, you could say, I just found the mother load and that would mean that you found like so much of what you want. And so that's a popular uh, phrase in English. So in this case he's talking about a book. <laughs> the mother load is this book which details, so that may, uh, means that describes in detail, so it has lots of different um, uh, examples and, and very specific information about the habits, the things that these people did. And this word here is notable. So notable, so not just uh, any scientist, but notable means important ones that we have taken note of because they have done something important in the past. Uh, so scientists like Albert Einstein, probably playwrights, um, like Shakespeare would be a person, philosophers and writers. He says it's a useful read, I mean helpful to him especially, um, because it can change the way we think about creative types specifically, so that just means especially or very uh, particularly about how they organize their days. It's not how we would think necessarily. We're usually taught that creative geniuses live spontaneous, eccentric, anything goes lives. You know, 
lots of turmoil, cigarettes, and questionable hats. And from a distance, this seems true enough, but when you look closer, you find a different reality. Okay, Dennis. Uh, I have a question. Uh, can, can I ask you? Yeah. About previous, uh, about scientists. Uh, it's always scientists, not scientists. Mm hmm scientists. Uh, not, not teasts, yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Do you hear? Do you hear it? No, it, it sounds like just not S T S at the end, and but just one S scientists. No, in plural yes. form. Right. Well, scientists. Yeah, you can. Notable scientists. It's it's kind of like you do put the S at the end here, but it kind of drops off. You know, so you're not. It's not like a. You don't have to um, emphasize it so much. Scientists. Does it say it again? Let me hear you say it. Uh, no, no. I mean, even without this T and S sound, like notable scientists, scientists. No, you scientists. say the S. Scientists. You say scientists. The, the S. Yeah. Okay. For plural. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, we we are usually taught the creative genius is life spontaneous, eccentric, anything goes lives. You know, lots of turmoil, cigarettes, and questionable hats. And from a distance, this seems true enough. But when you look closer, you find a different reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, spontaneous. So he's basically saying a lot of times when you when you think of somebody like Hemingway or something, you think of them as doing things spontaneously or just like all of a sudden they say, hey, I'm going to uh, travel to Spain or I'm going to go live in Brazil for a year or something like that. They're very spontaneous. They just do whatever they want to do whenever they feel like it. Or they're eccentric. Eccentric that might be used to describe somebody who they wear certain kinds of clothing or they do kind of weird interesting things that not everybody does. <laughs> so lots of times uh, creative people are described as eccentric because of that. And also this anything goes. So pretty much anything can happen and they just don't care. So that's how a lot of people think of those uh, types of people like Woody Allen maybe or movie actors or movie stars or something. And especially, like, a lot of times, because if you read People magazine, you might know that they have a lot of turmoil in their lives. That means uh, uh, trauma or lots of ups and downs or things that are happening, like uh, drug addictions, you know, alcoholics, that kind of stuff, and um, all these other things. So that's kind of how people think of them, and the reason why we think of them is because of magazines like uh, People magazine. But... He's saying that this book reveals a different reality. So that uh, creative people are like we think they are. Beneath that colorful Wes Anderson veneer, a factory is humming, driven by strong work habits. This marvelous book lets us see those habits clearly in the lives of creatives, from Churchill to Plath to Faulkner, to Ben Franklin, to Darwin. And in a way, that reveals useful truths about the conditions in which all our brains work best. Okay, Igor. Yeah. Where did you start? Beneath that colorful. Be beneath that colorful Wes Anderson veneer, a uh, factory is humming, dri driven by strong work habits, this marvelous book lets us see those habits clearly in the lives of creatives from Churchill to Plath to Faulkner to Ben Franklin to Darwin, and in a way that reveals usable truths um, about the conditions in which all our brains work best. Mm -hmm. So beneath that colorful veneer, so a veneer is like a kind of something that covers up something else. So when you go beneath that, so that means under that, so it looks like their lives are very colorful, but actually there's a factory with 
known to be very colorful and it's humming that means it's working uh, and so that really what he's saying with this sentence here is that even though they look very colorful on the outside what is really happening is that they're working they're working hard or they have some strong work habits um, this marvelous that means uh, wonderful marvelous means wonderful um, shows us that so these are just mentioned maybe you guys have probably heard of these people those are just examples of some of the people. They're mostly uh, West, you know, Western Americans, European people. All right. Rule number one, build a simple regimen and stick to it obsessively. The people in this book never wake up and chase whatever daily crisis comes along. They have an unbreakable routine, which they treat as almost holy. As Tolstoy put it, I must write each day without fail, not so much for the success of the work as in order not to get out of my routine. Okay, Ricardo? Or, sorry, <laughs> Rodolfo? Ricardo had to leave. Okay. Rule number one. Build a simple regimen and stick, it, stick to it obsess obsessively. The people in this book never wake up and chase whatever daily crisis comes along. They have an unbreakable routine, which they treat as almost holy. As Tolstoy put it, I must write each day without fail, not so much for the success of the work, as in order not to get out of my routine. Right. Okay, so what? why did he have write every day, Rodolfo? Why did he say he had to do that? Because yeah, yeah. Uh, he didn't want to get out of his routine. Yeah, right. So he, he has a routine. So this is the rule number one that these very creative people do, is that they have a routine. They have a regimen. So a regimen is just something that you do. Um, another word for regimen is routine. And they stick to it. So when you stick to it, that means you stay with it or you keep doing it. And they describe it as obsessively, like you're obsessed by doing it. You have to do it every day. So um, this is one of their habits. And Tolstoy, who's also an author, uh, he says, yeah, it's, he's not doing it because he's going to write a book necessarily every time he writes, but just that he needs to have that routine. And that's what helped him write the books eventually. Okay, is there anything in there you guys didn't quite understand that I need to go over? So this daily crisis, this is kind of a reference to what a lot of people do nowadays. A lot of people wake up early in the morning and they run to their computers and they check their email or they read the news and instead of having a very um, uh, routine habit, like uh, uh, morning ritual or habits that they do, this is kind of what happens and then they might read an email and then they have to answer an email, they do this stuff and so they kind of get... Uh, um, distracted perhaps and so that's what the author's saying that we can learn um, is one is to have a regimen to know what you're going to do instead of just trying to respond to anything that happens when you, as soon as you wake up in the morning okay next one is rule number two embrace weird little rituals it's striking to see how many of these creatives start their workday with a compulsive ritual whether it's Stephen King arranging the paper edges just so, or John Grisham feeling compelled to write the first word of the day at precisely 5.30 a.m., it's utterly OCD type behavior, but it's incredibly useful because it gets things moving. Okay, Aisha. Rule number two, embrace the middle pictures. It's striking to see how many of these creatives start their work day with a compulsive ritual. Whether it's, it's Stephen King arranging the paper edge just so, or John Grisham feeling compelled to write the first word of the day at precisely 5:30 a.m. It's it's literally us type behavior, but it it's Incredible use for because it gets things moving. Yeah. 
So they're kind of weird. So weird means uh, another word for weird would be strange or bizarre. Um, embrace means they, well, an embrace is like a hug, or it also means to, they, they hold fast to it. So they like to do these strange little things that they, they call rituals. So it could be anything. Typically a person's morning ritual often includes drinking a cup of coffee maybe or a cup of tea or something like that. But for these a very creative people, it's sometimes something a little bit weird or strange. Um, he says here it's striking to see. So striking is another way to say surprising. So it's surprising to see how they start their work day with compulsive. Compulsive, like you have to do it. Like they don't, they can't not do it. And that's what uh, he referred to here as OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. It's a type of thing where you have to keep doing it. A lot of times you've probably heard about obsessive compulsive is like when somebody washes their hands like all the time, that's also known as like obsessive compulsive. This word here, utterly, means um, it's just a, a word that emphasizes that it's it's utterly or it's really uh, OCD type behavior. But it can be useful because it gets things moving. So it's something that they do that helps them. Each person has their own little one, of course, and it helps them move into something that they need to do if they're going to paint or they're going to write or they're going to make a business deal or something like that. Okay? Teacher, well, yes. D, what means in, in the OCD? OCD means mm -hmm. obsessive, it's obsessive. Compulsory and, yeah, disorder. Uh, okay. Yeah. Have you heard of that before? No, obsessive compulsive, yeah, but the disorder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah the dis that's why I was asking. Okay, yeah, dis they be. yeah. Yeah, disorder is something like when they say something's wrong with you. So if you went to like a psychologist or a psychiatrist, they mm -hmm. would give you a diagnosis, maybe. Diagnosis, yeah. Diagnosis would be this disorder, you know. So it's not typical that people would have this. But a lot of times, these very, very creative people who are very successful, they are a little bit obsessive compulsive because they have to have things just so <laughs> they have to do it just like the way they need it Bipolar done. Bipolar crisis or something like that. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, rule number three, work in two phases, one production and two review. Many of the people in this book use mornings to produce their work and set aside evenings to review, evaluate, and plan, which makes perfect sense. These are two distinct skill sets. Putting time and space between them helps you better, be better at both. Okay, Amparo. Rule number three, work in two phases. One, um, production, and two, review. Many of the people in this book use morning to produce their work and set aside evening to review, evaluate, and plan, which makes perfect sense. These are two distinct skill sets. Uh, putting time and space between them helps you be, be better at both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's pretty simple. They just do two different uh, two different time periods. So maybe they wake up you know, early in the morning, do their writing, for example, for a writer, or their painting or something, and then later on they will do other things during the middle of the day and then come back and then they will evaluate. When you evaluate something that means you're looking at um, what is it, is it good, does it need to be improved, do you need to um, fix something, and then you would make a plan probably for the next day what you're going to do. So, and he's saying that that makes perfect sense, so it makes good sense, you could say, or it just makes sense. Perfect there adds emphasis to that because they're two distinct, distinct means different. So they're two different skill sets. One is the production and the other is reviewing. And you put in time and then put space between them. Space means just the time that you go off and do something else, like have lunch or meet with your friends or go do something that you like. All right, rule number four. Do your most important work right after you wake up. Almost to a person, the people in this book accomplish their best work first thing in the morning. This is no accident. Our brains function best after sleep. When it's spent hours churning on the problems of the previous day. 
While there are some night owls in the book, others testify to the fact that working at night can be deceptive. The work flows easily, but proves subpar in the clear light of morning. Yep, they're talking about you, Kerouac. <laughs> okay, rule number four. Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, rule number four. Uh, do your most important work. Uh, do your most important work right after you wake up. Almost to a person, the people in this book accomplish their best work first thing in the morning. This is not accident. Our brains function best after sleep. We're gonna spend hours uh, churning, yeah, uh, all the problems of the previous day. Yeah, while there is, uh, while there are some nights owls in the book. Others testified to the fact that walking at night can be deceptive. The work flows easily, but proves subpar in the clear light of morning. Yep, they are talking about you, Kerouac. <laughs> okay, good. Yes, so a lot of uh, people think that creative people stay up really late and that that's when they do all of their work. But according to the uh, what this author found in this book, that almost to a person, so that means almost every one of them, that's what that little phrase there means, or expression, uh, they accomplished or they, they were able to do their best work first thing in the morning. So that means real, you know, pretty early in the morning, not exactly right when you get out of bed, but, you know, before you do other things, you go to work and you produce. So he says this isn't an accident. Our brains function best after sleep. And this word here, churning, you said it right spent hours churning, so if he describes the brain as churning on something, that means turning it around. So you can also uh, churn butter, make butter by hand, they would churn it with, uh, by mixing it until it became butter, the cream, you know, and um, so that's what that word means, just turning things over in your head when you're uh, sleeping or when you're going to bed at night, and then you sleep. And then you wake up and you're refreshed so you can do work again. Night owls is what we call people like Asia <laughs> and probably some of you guys who are staying up late to take verbaling classes. Um, these are people who like to stay up uh, late and do things at night rather than waking up early. Uh, here's the word here, testify. Others testify. That means they give proof to the fact that working at night can be deceptive. deceptive is you think it's going to be one way and then it's not. So a lot of people think that if they stay up late at night they're going to get a lot of work done maybe because nobody else is awake and it's quiet or something but it's that's deceptive. It means it doesn't really actually happen that way. In fact if um, the work that you do at night a lot of time proves sub means sub means under and so subpar means under what you want it to be, so not as good is what subpar means. So if something is described as subpar, it means not as good. And Kerouac, that's a reference to a, uh, an American uh, poet and writer. So I guess he was known to stay up late, <laughs> but maybe his work wasn't as good as some other people's. Okay, so number five, rule number five, save socializing for later in the day. Socializing seems to serve as crucial creative fuel and most people in this book did their visiting in the afternoon and evening which was easy if you lived a century ago and a good deal tougher in our hyper-connected age. Some modern creatives solve it by getting up insanely early. Others limit email and internet to afternoons. Way easier said than done, in my experience. Okay, Igor? Save socializing for later in the day. Socializing seems to serve as crucial creative fuel. And most people in this book uh, did their visiting in the afternoon and evening, which was easy if you lived a century ago and a good deal th tower, how to do that? Tougher. Tougher. 
tougher in our hyper hyperconnected age. Mm -hmm. Some modern creatives solve it by getting up insanely early. Others uh, limit email and internet to afternoons. Way easier said than done, in my experience. Yeah. <laughs> so socializing just means getting together with other people and talking. Um, so they used to do that later in the day. And he says it's crucial. If something is crucial, it means it's very important. So it's crucial creative fuel. So these three words put together here basically describe that it's what helps people be creative, is to socialize with their friends, to get outside, meet people, and talk about things, that that was really important for them to be creative. But they did it later in the afternoon and in the evening. And Daniel Coyle, the author, is saying that it's tougher, so that means it's more difficult nowadays, because we're in a hyper-connected age. That means we are connected all the time. We can talk to people all day, 24-7, via Skype, the Internet, on our smartphones, cell phones, things like that. So some modern creative, so that would be people that day, uh, living today, and are very creative writers and painters and artists and things like that, they, get it, they, do, um, they solve this problem by getting up insanely early Probably insanely early would be like if you got up at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m., maybe even 6 a.m. Um, it's just really super – insane means like it's crazy. It's maybe crazy at 2 a.m. Yeah, maybe 2 a.m. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. He didn't specify in text. No, he didn't. But typically people who have to go to work probably get up by 6. So he's probably meaning, yeah, more like 2, 3, 4 a.m. Um, that would be insanely early. Others um, limit email. If you read people's blogs that talk about um, getting work done and stuff like that, a lot of people say to check your email only like a couple of times a day, not be checking it every five minutes or something like that. And they leave Facebook and stuff like that till later in the day. But the author writes, this is way easier. That means that is super, like it's much easier. So when we say way, we mean much easier said than done. So it's not easy to do. Because <laughs> a lot of people want to see, read their email and see what's going on with everybody, check Facebook, that kind of thing. So rule number six, exercise. Sure, Curry's List has its share of alcoholics and agoraphobes, but a surprising number make daily time for vigorous exercise. Whether it's Dickens and his marathon hikes around London, or Hemingway and boxing. They prove what researchers are finding. Regular workouts sharpen the brain. Okay, Rolfo. Yes, exercise. Sure, Curry's list its share of alcoholics and agoraphobes, but a surprising number make daily time for vigorous exercise. Whether it's Dickens and his marathon, hikes around London, or Hemingway and boxing, they proved what res researchers are finding. Regular workouts sharpened brain. Yeah. So, agoraphobes, uh, a person who is described as an agoraphobe or somebody who is agoraphobic, that's a person who doesn't like crowds. So that's what that means. So a person who doesn't like to go out of their house very much and go out and socialize. And also alcoholics. So yeah, of course, some people were alcoholics. Even today, some people who are very creative and very successful, they also you know do drugs or they have their own problems. But one thing that a lot of them had in common was vigorous exercise. Vigorous means like you're working out really hard. It means you're going to breathe heavy. It's not just taking a leisurely nice walk. It's like running, hiking, riding your bike, something like that. So it's something that gets you um, tired. And of course researchers today find that regular workouts sharpen the brain. Sharpen the brain that means makes it better so that you can use it better. When you survey these habits, they seem to be surprisingly mundane. I mean, exercise, get up early, but in a deeper way, perhaps that's the most powerful and paradoxical idea of all. Reliable, effective creativity is built on orderly foundations. 
to be truly creative, you have to be brave enough to be boring. Okay, Aisha. When, when you survey this habit, they seem to be surprisingly mundane. I mean, exercise, they are early, but in a deeper way, perhaps, that's the most powerful and paradoxical idea of all. Reliable, effective, creativity is built on orderly foundation. To be truly creative, you have to be brave enough to be born. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, so it's surprisingly mundane. When you describe something as mundane, it just means kind of like, yeah, boring. Nothing special about it. It's not like exciting or interesting or wonderful. It's just eh, normal, mundane. So that's what he says. You know, he thought, you know, maybe you thought if you were going to read this book, you were going to find something like, oh, they did these amazing things. But really, they just had some pretty normal habits of exercising, working early in the morning, doing something every day like a ritual or something like that. And he's saying, but maybe that's really um, something powerful that we can learn from. It's paradoxical. That means it's like the opposite of what you think it might be. But really, it's reliable. Something is reliable means you can count on it. It's really going to work. It's effective. So if you want reliable, effective creativity, that means you're a writer. If you make your money by writing, you have to be able to write, right? So you can't necessarily leave it up to just like, oh, I, I got inspired today, but what if you don't get inspired for the next five years and you don't write another book? You won't be able to make a living as a writer. So these people who really wanted to do that, they were very um, orderly, and they created their foundations built a foundation is what you build on the foundation of a building for example is the bottom part maybe cement or something that you start building on so they have strong orderly foundations and that helps them to be creative you have to be brave enough to be boring so um, I have a question from this paragraph yes. when you survey these habits uh, what mm -hmm. does that mean uh, yeah. when you survey these habits okay so to, to take a survey um, means when yeah, you... Yeah, I know what is that, that but how, mm -hmm. what is in the meaning uh, habits? What habits? Oh, habits are, habits. Habits are things, habits are things no, that you do. Who they survey? Okay, they surveyed um, all these different people. All these like Charles Dickens, Charles Darwin, Hemingway. They, this person who wrote the book that this guy's talking about, he went back and looked at these people's lives and the things that they did regularly like what how did they live and this is what he came up with he so he did a survey of them that means he went and looked at these different habits of people of these successful creative people and he put them together um, in a book so that now we can read about what they did does that make sense so yeah but uh, what is the survey so in this context uh, I mean uh, surveys uh, when you ask uh, people yeah. so something, when you how they how yeah. he asked uh, dead people yeah so when you survey th in this case it means when you look at so he couldn't talk to people who are dead obviously so what he did is he went back and read interviews biographies probably um, you know a lot of times uh, people who live with these people sometimes people's ex-husbands or wives or girlfriends or boyfriends write about them in their memoirs or something. That's what he did for his research. So he went back and found information um, that told you what these people did. For example, Picasso, you know, there's lots of people who wrote about the type of things that Picasso did. So you would be but able to look at that. This information may be um, not so correct uh, because it's not from first source. And it, it may be, um, how we can say that, uh, not correct in, in one mm -hmm. word. Well, let's I mean, how, how he know that uh, this information is correct? You know that in books you may write uh, something uh, um, that represents you from a sure. good uh, part uh, of you and to hide uh, our part, so yes. uh, kind of well, objective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So um, here's I'm, what I'm having right here, what I'm looking at and sharing. The screen is actually the um, this guy's blog, the the person that wrote this book. And so when I looked at it, it looks like he 
it went back and he was actually like for example he has an interview here so he didn't interview Simone de Beauvoir but he was reading one that took place in 1965 for example so he's going back and reading what uh, people wrote about at that time so yeah it's probably not exactly hundred percent accurate and how can we really know very um, accurately what these people did every day of their lives or something but in general um, because people when they're famous people really do want to know about their lives and so even when they were living people were asking them so what do you do every day what do you how do you live and so that's what he did he for example C.S. Lewis this person who wrote uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and those kind of books he's not alive today but he wrote about himself so you can go back and read those things. It's just that this person who wrote this book compiled it. So when you compile something, it means you put it all together. And so he he came up with um, he came up with these different people and wrote a book about what they the type the types of things that they did regularly. So that's why according called, to, according yeah. to the interviews and according to yeah according their to interviews, manuscripts or what? yeah. Right. According to their interviews, according to their own autobiographies, books that they yeah. wrote themselves about the way they lived. Yeah. And of course, okay. that's only 161 people. There's a lot more people in the world and in, in the past. So who knows? But um, interesting to think about. Aisha, what do you think? Do you think it's a, a good idea to uh, wake up early in the morning and get things done? <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I always sleep late, uh, so I can really wake up at uh, 6 or 7. But if I had an interview or something important to do, uh -huh. I wake up, but I'm not really in a good shape. Yeah. So what, for you, uh, what is like your most productive time of the day? What is the time of the day where you work the most? Well... I will say the night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I see. I saw he said that it's not the good uh, time. Mm -hmm. I know it's not the good time, but uh, I I can concentrate on the, the night because in the day I find myself so distracted. I, I don't mm. know. Yeah, I find that too. That sometimes it's easier when everybody goes to bed and you're just. Yeah, nobody was texting yeah. me or calling you. <laughs> calling you or texting you, yeah. Right. What about you, Amparo? What do you do? Uh, do you wake up early in the morning or do you like to stay up late? Or when I, 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 all the time I work in, in the morning. Mm -hmm. When I was at the school or at the high school, or, uh, I prefer to study in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes when I, <laughs> it was so late, uh, maybe you are so quiet, but that calls me to the bed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, it's not for me. <laughs> yeah, it it's nice work. and quiet and time to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dennis, what about you? What? When do you like to do work? Uh. My my most productive hours is from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. So I don't know how about getting earlier, but 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 about uh, exercise, I I agree, I completely agree. It's uh -huh. definitely definitely so. Do you get regular exercise? Yeah. What yeah, do you like I, to do? And, and I strongly recommend it to, to everyone. Uh huh. Uh, but just just go go to I don't know maybe for women it's it's not so uh, so good. But I go would go to gym and just. Uh, like, do you uh, lift weights or you do? Lift lift weights. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. It's very it's very, actually very good. Yeah. For your brain, yeah. for your brain. Uh huh. I, I mean, not even for your body. Buddy. Yeah, great. Well, what do you think, Igor, about uh, exercise or about getting? I think you get up pretty early, don't you, Igor? No, not so early, but I think, uh, and for me, an ideal is uh, to go to sleep at ten o'clock. 
an yeah. ideal ideal situation. Yeah. To get up uh, about uh, five, six, seven, it depends. I uh, uh, I do not have alarm clock, so at what time I get up? At what time? How we can say that it's okay? Yeah, you get up whenever you get up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We say, we say I get up whenever I get up. So yeah. <laughs> at five, six, seven. Uh, average it's six o'clock. Average six okay. thirty. Uh -huh. Average. Yeah. But uh, I make it up at 5.30, for example. Uh -huh. And uh, the most productive time, it's, uh, f I think, from when I get up till mm -hmm. uh, about 11 uh, mm -hmm. o'clock, 11.30. Uh, yeah. And uh, from 12 o'clock till 2 o'clock, it's not so productive time. Mm. And uh, from 2 o'clock uh, till 4.30, it's productive time. Yeah. And fr from 30 till 6, it's not productive. And from 6 till 10, it's the same productive as uh, from the start of the day, from mm -hmm. 6 o'clock till. So this is it. Yeah. When my mind is very clear, from 6 o'clock till uh, 11.30, from uh, 2 o'clock till 4.30, and uh, from 6 till, 11, uh, till 10. Yeah. So, Igor, do you work from home or do you go into an office? No, I work uh, in an office. Oh, in an office. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, how, what time do you have to be at your office? At uh, 8, 9. Okay. It depends uh, because uh, uh, I work as a sales representative. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, that's pretty lucky that you don't have to use an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I know that I would, uh, I will get up uh, n no later, uh, no later, or how we can say? Yeah, no later than. Yeah, no later than seven thirty. Uh huh, and that gives you enough time to get ready and. Yeah, get of to course. Work. Yeah. Okay. I know for sure that uh, seven thirty is uh, deadline. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dead time. Yeah. Good. May I say something? Yeah, Aisha, go ahead. Uh, about the exercising. Okay. I I agree because when I start playing tennis, uh, I think two years ago, mm -hmm. I had the most higher grade uh, at school. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so I think How? it's true. So, so I didn't hear what you said. You what were you were you playing tennis? Is that what you said? Yeah, oh, okay. I started playing like uh, two years ago in that uh -huh. school. I have the, my most higher grades. Your highest grades. Wow, yeah. that's that's a good testimony. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you still play tennis? Uh, not as often I want. Uh huh. Mm. When you when that happened, were you playing like every day? Not every day, but like two two times a week. Oh okay, that's that's great. Do you do any other types of exercise now, like regularly, or? Uh, not really. No. Hmm. What about you, Amparo? I am not good at sport, women. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I am not fat, but. <laughs> <laughs> Do you walk or do things like that or n nothing? <laughs> Almost nothing. Some from time to time, I I I, I may um, I try to exercise at home in uh, Pilates. Power gym. Pilates, Pilates, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, or one uh, equipment for your legs. Yeah, uh -huh. but it's not. Uh, I don't do it uh, daily. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. Have you ever tried like yoga or anything like that? No, never. No. no. So, Igor, what about you? Do you do exercise? I know Dennis said he lifts weights, goes to the gym. I only um, go jogging. Uh huh. But not every day. I think uh, three times in a week, four times maximum. Yeah. How far do you jog? About uh, one, two kilometers. Oh, okay. 
Not so, not so many kilometers because uh, I don't have so much time to to, to do exercise. I have uh, other uh, occupation, job, uh, and sure. to learn English. So. Yeah, right. So how that, about you, Lisa? If I may ask. What? How about you? Me? <laughs> 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 I try to go for walks regularly, and I used to go to the gym, but then I got too busy. So I couldn't, I didn't go enough. So I canceled my membership. So I, I like, uh, I like doing sports and getting exercise, but I don't do it as much as I'd like to. Like in the winter, I like to ski, but I don't go as much as I would like to. But when I do, it's really fun. Yeah. Okay. But at least I try to go walking regularly. <laughs> but I agree, it would be better if I could do more. Sounds like, Dennis, you're the one who's doing the most exercise out of our group. <laughs> yes. <laughs> A lazy group. <laughs> you just, you, you just uh, have to sell your car. And, <laughs> sell my car, uh, yeah. And, and all will be great. And just walk everywhere. Well, it is true. Um, yeah, yeah. When when I uh, when I was 15, I was a foreign exchange student. I lived in Spain, and... Um, I walked to school. I walked everywhere, and I lost some weight, and it just—it was really good because it was really nice to be able to just go everywhere. But um, yeah, I have a car now. You <laughs> <laughs> give your bicycle. <laughs> yeah. You are not you are not friendly with the environment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I live in a very small town, though, so I don't actually use it that much. But I have three kids, so. <laughs> but we ride our bikes and we walk. I went, I went for a long walk today to the beach for about an hour and a half, so that was good. But I, d I don't do it every day, so. But I try to, yeah. It, it also depends on the weather, right, Aisha? Because if you live yeah. in places that are cold... Then, <laughs> because in winter, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But Dennis, you said you're from Russia? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, yeah. So you know about harsh winter weather. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's I don't have I don't have excuses. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, you don't have any excuses because you have wonderful weather, sun, warm, beaches. <laughs> no excuses. No excuses, yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering uh, as another ba part of what? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, bad, bad weather. It's not. It's also not an excuse. You can uh, work perfectly. Uh, winter and yeah. summer, you can chug again, and so so it's not it's not excuse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How how long have you been working out, Dennis? Uh, like how many years? Uh, you you mean go to go to gym? Yeah. yeah. How long yeah. have you been going to uh, the gym? Maybe maybe three or four years. Yeah. When when you go, do you go with friends or do you go by yourself? Uh, it, dep it depends. Uh, usually alone. Yeah. It's it's bad it's bad it's bad actually to 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 go to gym alone because yeah. it's just um my people around you. It's very uh, how can I say um they. Mm. Distracting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you uh, so. Yeah. Well, that's that's what I was just going to talk about is distracting because we he mentioned in the article about uh, how people can modern day people can get distracted. So I'm wondering what what do you guys get distracted by the most during your day, Igor? What do you get distracted by? What do you mean distracted? So distracted means, so say for example you want to get up and you want to go to work, but instead you get distracted by something that takes you away from what you wanted to do, and so you go do something else instead. So for example, uh, like oftentimes I might get distracted because I start looking at Facebook, and then, then I watch a vi YouTube video, and then I <laughs> go read an article, and really all I wanted to do was check my email really fast quickly <laughs> but oh. then I, I got distracted 
because and I started doing something else instead. That's what it means no. to be distracted. Yeah, I do not have uh, things that distract me from something to do. Because yeah. uh, when I want really to do something, I do that. In any case, uh, I I do not get distracted by our by email or by Facebook or by any kind of things. Yeah. So you have more discipline. It sounds like, like you. If you have discipline, it means if you say you're going to do something, then you're going to do it. You're not going to let other things distract you, like phone calls or people, you know, coming wanting to talk to you about something. And yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. If, it's, if it's very important, I will do that. Of yeah. I, I do not forget. I have always in my mind that to do mm -hmm. if it's very important. Yeah. So you know what you want to get accomplished. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Dennis? Do you get distracted by things? Mm, yes. Yes, sometimes. Yes, anyone. Like, what would be a common distraction for you? Uh, it, it depends on what I'm doing. Do you have any kids? Uh, no. no. <laughs> That's I'm a big yet. distraction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not married, so okay. wife is Elsa. <laughs> it's such a big problem. So. Well, girl, Maybe. girlfriends can be a distraction too. <laughs> 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 so I, I, I don't have a distraction. Okay. Like. <laughs> no distraction. Uh, Ampara, how about you? Do you get distracted by stuff? Not really. When I have to, to a plan for the next day, well, I plan, uh, I prepare my schedule since the, the, the day before. So oh. I don't have trouble with that. You guys are organized. All right. What about you, yeah. Aisha? I'm saying the dog because everyone seems organized. <laughs> we can learn something from them about oh, organization. Yeah. <laughs> I'm distracted by everything. <laughs> All the things going on on the internet. My sister. I, I just have a list. I should have. Uh, do you have yeah. children? Uh, no. I I have, not. She does not have children. Yeah. <laughs> um, but do you have children? No, I'm single. <laughs> now you're single. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Children can be a distraction. Boyfriends, yeah. girlfriends can be distractions. <laughs> but they can this be is not distraction. <laughs> this is life. <laughs> ah, I knew it. It made me say that because when she say a girlfriend can be a distraction, we we women we don't say anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I knew when she would say man or someone. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. I think I think I think laziness is, is the main distraction. Yeah. 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 All I, right. I do not know uh, people who go only to job and uh, uh, do work every day and no distraction. And sure. <laughs> Yeah. Something well, that's, uh, that's life. Like you said, it's life. I mean, if somebody yeah. calls, you're gonna answer the phone, and yeah. But cer certain times we can we can uh, go overboard. We call it. If you go overboard, that means you've gone too far. So, you know, answering the phone, whatever you need to do is fine. But sometimes, if you answer the phone and then you notice, oh, I just talked for an hour, and I didn't really accomplish anything. Sometimes that can be a problem if you do it a lot. So, yeah. Okay, guys, there our class is over. Thanks for coming and uh, reading. You got you guys are doing really great. Um, do you have any other questions before we end the class? Uh, 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 sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Asia. Uh, the guy uh, who, who has the blog. Yeah, Daniel Coyle. Yeah, did he have a book or just a blog? Yes, yes. His book is called The Talent Code. And I think if you type in like the talent code PDF you can find a free version of it online somewhere mm -hmm. and he has some really good ideas not just for um, well he has good ideas for um, success in many different areas so if you look through his blog and watch some of his videos it's it's pretty interesting stuff if you like that topic okay, Thank you. okay. yeah great this uh, person who wrote book he's creative uh, himself or he's not creative 
Uh, I would say he's creative, but he's probably not as well known as Hemingway, for example. <laughs> I think yeah. you cannot write uh, about something that you cannot do. No. I mean, yeah. uh, you you write only information that uh, you, if you write something that you cannot do, this is not uh, such uh, valuable information. Yeah. Well, he's a re he's more of a researcher in compiling information and stories about things, and then trying to find patterns for you know what do successful people do, like Tiger Woods, for example, successful sports or um, ath athletes. And so I don't know. You can check it out and read it. I think uh, you're skeptical, Igor. You sound skeptical. No, I. No? I like uh, I I will I will if I have, um, I will search his book on the internet and okay. I will, I will uh, sc ski, scan or skim how how can skim say it. That. Yeah, you'll skim yeah. it. I will not read, but I will read on the first page in the middle and then at the end, and after okay. that I will decide to read this book or not. <laughs> right, good. That's good. Okay, great. All right, thanks, you guys. See you another time. Thank you. Okay. Night. Thanks. Uh, do better in the things that we are interested in doing better. So I always like to read his um, information because it doesn't matter if you are an artist or a musician or a business person or learning a foreign language. I like his, um, his ideas and his information and his research that he does. I always find it very interesting and useful uh, for us people who are learning other languages and so especially for you guys who are learning uh, how to improve your English and so we're going to be reading his article uh, like I said it's actually from his blog and so um, if you click on the link I will give it to you guys again I'm just uh, going to talk a little bit it's here as we get everybody into the Google Hangouts the link is um, in the Verblink chat. It is a link to a Google document because I have copied from his blog uh, and pasted it into the Google document. I also provide the link directly to his website at the top so in case you're interested in other things that he writes about. He often um, writes blog posts and puts up videos or pictures or things like that so it's really good. I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> Aisha, do you like People Magazine? <laughs> Not really, but I find it funny. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know if uh, Aisha caught it. I don't know if everybody else caught it, but my reference to um, People Magazine, People Magazine is a magazine in the United States that is mostly kind of like a gossip magazine where they write about movie stars and singers and actresses, things like that. Um, always they are talking about who married who, who got divorced from who, who had a baby, <laughs> all those types of things. Um, and it's funny because just the other day I was working with uh, one of my private students and he's a law professor from Brazil and so he likes to read very academic uh, texts and he said reading in English for him in the academic text is quite easy. And but reading People magazine is harder because <laughs> because it's so many different words that he does not is not so familiar with, and that's a certain type of writing. So <laughs> it's it's kind of funny. Okay, okay, Tan, you can't join. All right, well you can listen. All right, so let's see. It looks like everybody's there. So what I'm going to do is. Hi everybody, this is Lisa and it's time again for another Verbling class. In this class we're going to be doing some reading and if you have a reservation go ahead and uh, get it now and come into the class so that we can get started. Uh, hi Aisha, how are you doing? Are you there? Good. <laughs> hi there. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, some people have uh, reservations and you yep. can come and get them now and that way as soon as everybody comes into the Google Hangouts then we can start the class. We're going to be reading an, an article. It's actually a blog 
post and the blog post is from an author named Daniel Coyle and he has written a couple of books uh, one of his books is called The Talent Code and so he likes to write about uh, success and the things that we can do to uh, help ourselves good um, I like his writing it's a good example of uh, some good English also for people who are interested in a little bit higher level English it's um, it's not your everyday kind of uh, something you would find like in People magazine or something but uh, so it's a little bit uh, more academic if you're uh, studying for some tests like the TOEFL exam or something like that um, he's a good person to read um, because it's fun to read his stuff but it also um, has good uh, high-level vocabulary in it okay so let's uh, get started we have people I'm just gonna say hi to everybody hi Asia and hi Amparo how are you hi teacher how are you good uh, and uh, Denise or Dennis yeah Dennis hi. hi Dennis how are you I'm fine I'm fine Great. hello everybody hi there and where are you from Dennis I'm from Russia. Oh, okay, great. And hi, Ricardo, how are you? Hello, teacher. Hello, everybody. How's Sao Paulo? Yes, yeah, Sao Paulo, Brazil. <laughs> All right, great. And uh, Rodolfo, how are you doing? So fine, thanks. Are you? Just put the article that we have in the screen share. And what I like to do for the reading classes is I like to uh, read first. So while I'm reading, that is giving you the opportunity to listen to how I pronounce the word. So you can be reading along, and if there's particular words that maybe you haven't come across before or you're not sure how to pronounce them, listen to how I'm pronouncing them. And then everybody is going to have a chance to read. And this article is not very long, but it does have a lot of words that I'm probably going to um, explain. So we'll probably have time at the end to discuss it and uh, talk about the article itself and then also talk about maybe what it brings up for you if you have uh, some ideas about it or maybe you do some of these things in your own life. Mm. So let's get started. And if, let me just tell everybody who's out in Verbling land, if you are watching uh, the class right now and you are a member, you can come into the class uh, for one ticket and that way you will also have the opportunity to read and practice your reading and also your pronunciation and speaking 